All right, I'm going to get things started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trustees Conservation and Action webinar series. My name is Cynthia Jetbrenner. I'm the Director of Coast and Natural Resources at the Trustees. And I'd like to start by just thanking all of you for joining us today. I hope you're excited to get an in-depth look at a lot of the great, amazing work we're doing at the Trustees for our special places. This is the first in the series. Um, each one of our 120 properties has its own unique history and treasures to offer, as I'm sure, sure you've experienced. We have a team of stewards, curators, ecologists, all sorts of staff working with many uh, to bring these environments to life. Today, specifically, you'll hear about the work we're doing through our State of the Coast strategy and the impacts of climate change on our developed coasts. These uh, efforts would not be possible without support of donors and we cannot thank them enough. So if you're on this webinar, big thank you to you. A lot has changed this last year. So a lot of these engagement efforts with the community have gone virtual. This webinar series is one of that, uh, those examples. And our team has also done an excellent, incredible job keeping our properties open and operating safely. We saw this last year over 2 million visitors to our property. And we've seen many people gain a renewed appreciation for nature and getting outside. So I hope these webinars inspire you to get out as well and explore some of our, some of our properties and some new reservations for you. And you'll learn through these webinars about a lot of the initiatives and projects that are happening behind the scenes. So thank you again for supporting our mission to protect and share the, pla uh, protect and share the places that we love. Logistics during this webinar series, you will have you'll be able to submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you move your cursor, you'll see it appear. And then we're going to have three speakers and we'll pause after each for questions. The speakers will be myself starting out, <laughs> followed by Cecil Baron Jensen, who is the executive director of Remain Nantucket. She'll talk about resilience work on Nantucket. And then we're gonna have Linda Orrell, who's the Director of Policy here at the Trustees, talk about some innovative policy work to address threats to our coast. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the microphone to myself. So Christine, if you would advance to my slide, that would be great. My, um, oh. So first I'll introduce myself. I, again, I am Cynthia Dittbrenner, Director of Coastal Natural Resources at the Trustees. I have not been here very long. I started at the trustees this last summer. <clears throat> Prior to that, I had a 20 plus year career in natural resources that spanned river and stream restoration, salmon habitat recovery, flooding issues, um, agriculture resilience, and now coast and coastal resilience. So excited to be here leading this team. Our team is charged with caring for the natural resources at our reservations across the state. So we care for forests and salt marsh and coasts and barrens and grasslands all across the state. Part of my role is to help lead our coastal strategy work in the state of the coast report, which is what we're going to talk about today. I somehow lost the title slide, but the title slide was uh, said that we're going to focus on uh, our developed coastline. So this is part of a three different webinars that will be part of this conservation action series focused on state of the coast. This first one is developed coast, and then we have beaches, and then the third one is salt marsh. So I wanna take just a quick step back and talk about coastal strategy first. Five years ago, well, I'll start by saying we, our, his, our organization has a history of 130 years now. We're a very old organization, and over that time we have accumulated 120 miles of coastline that we either own or manage. And I'm sure you've been to some of these beaches We've got Crane Beach up in the north, some beautiful beaches on the islands, Cape Hogue, Norton, um, Cascade Co. 2 Wildlife Refuge. Hopefully you've had a chance to see some of those. And five years ago, we said, we're seeing a lot of impacts from climate change, sea level rise, coastal storms, erosion. So we had a coastal vulnerability assessment done to look at the impacts of sea level rise and storm surge on our reservation specifically. And that information was very illuminating. <laughs> um, it gave us a lot of information that was helpful to figure out what we were going to do with some of our infrastructure, how to protect our beach habitats. But it was also a little bit scary. And we thought we need to develop a broader strategy for the coast. So we brought together a bunch of different groups in our organization, reached out to partners, 
and developed a coastal strategy with these three tenants, protect and advocate for our coasts. Linda will talk some about that policy work when she is up. Inspire a love of coast, so really getting people outside and getting them engaged in our work. And then three, focus on our vulnerable places. So looking at those in a, from a scientific lens, trying to figure out what types of projects we could do to make them more resilient. Next. So part of that coastal strategy was to launch State of the Coast reports. We wanted to do one each year for five years for the different stretches of the Massachusetts coastline. The first one was for the North Shore and that came out in two, uh, 2020. And then last summer we published the one for the islands, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket and Gosnell. That's what I'm presenting on today. We just started our effort for the next one which will be launched this next summer. And that will be for the South Coast of Buzzards Bay area. Next. Before I show you the maps, I wanna show you what's behind them. This is what we're facing as far as sea level rise and storm surge. So this graph on the left shows sea level rise and the green line shows what we've experienced to date up to 2020. And then you'll see four diverging dotted lines out into the future. It's hard to predict the future. These four lines represent different emission scenarios. So how many greenhouse gas emissions are we going to emit on this planet? And depending on how many we admit, we're, admit we're on different trajectories for sea level rise. Now the state and others advise us to plan to the high level, which is the yellow line. That's the trajectory we're on now. Clearly it would be great if we could reduce emissions and get onto one of those bluer lines, but in all scenarios, we're looking at sea level rise. For Nantucket specifically, we are looking from about 2010 to 2050, it's 2.67, I'll just say 2.6 since it's not an exact science, feet of sea level rise. And then out to 2070, 4.5. And then out to 2100, we're looking at eight feet of sea level rise on that high scenario. Now the graph to the right talks more about storm surge. So storm surge is a different thing. We expect to have stronger storms into the future. The, the lighter orange is the one in 10 year storm event and the darker is the one in 100 year storm event. So the one in 10, is a storm we expect to see about every 10 years. In one year, there's a 10% chance of that happening. So an interesting comparison you can make on this graph is that right now, the 100 year storm event, that dark orange, is equivalent or a little bit lower than the 10 year storm event in 2050. So in 30 years, a storm that we would normally see once in a lifetime is gonna be a storm that we see about every 10 years. Next. So here I'll get into some of the key findings for the islands. You can go to the next. I'm gonna talk about erosion and flooding today specific to our developed coastline, so where our communities are. This map shows erosion areas, and uh, this is in Edgar Town, Eel Pond. The, so these dotted lines show you where the historic beaches were or shorelines were. The red shows where it was in the, uh, sorry, 1890s. Uh, so you can see there was a barrier beach protecting this, hence the name Eel Pond. I had several people say, oh, that's why it was called Eel Pond, because it was not a pond now. Um, yellow, 1970s, it had breached sometime in that period. 18, I'm sorry, uh, 1980s is the green. And then you can see the aerial of where it is now. Because that barrier beach is gone, the pink now shows you the areas that are high risk to erosion to the year 2050. Go ahead and click. The next, Christine. So what we did was across both islands, we overlaid that pink high erosion area with our infrastructure, roads and buildings. By 2015, across both islands, we expect 800 structures to be threatened, which is $4.6 billion in, the parcels represent $4.6 billion in land value. We were unable to actually get the value of the structures, which could be quite high and make that number quite a bit higher and then 44 miles of roads at risk. Next. Now I'm gonna move into flooding and just sea level rise in general. Here's an example of Nantucket. The red shows a projection for how high the daily tidal flooding will be in 2050. So in 30 years, a daily high tide could, is projected to flood these areas you see in red. And then the yellow shows the 100 year storm flooding. So that would be flooded once approximately every 100 years, not, not a science, a 1% chance every year. And then we overlay that 
with our roads and structures, the green shows the roads and buildings that are within that daily title, the area that is going to be daily tidally flooded in 2050. Next. So in on the island of Nantucket, by 2050, we predict that 628 structures will be flooded daily. If you broaden that to a 10 year storm event, so the 10% the chance of a big storm happening every year, it ups to 1400 structures. And then uh, 25 miles of road flooded daily. Next. Here's that same map scenario on Martha's Vineyard in Edgartown. So again, the red is areas that in 2050 are projected to be flooded daily by tides. And then the green shows the structures that are overlaid over that, the roads and buildings that could be impacted by that daily high, high um, tide. Next. Oops, there, thank you. <laughs> so across Martha's Vineyard, again, if we add these up, there's many towns around Martha's Vineyard. So we add them all up, it's about 290 structures would be flooded daily in a 10 year storm that increases to over 2000. And then miles of road, 16 would be flooded daily and in a 10 year storm, 95 miles of road. Next. You can access this online. So the trustees.org forward slash coast will bring you, uh, you click on this um, three bars in the top right, which is your menu, hit state of the coast, toggle down to maps. And then these are the different maps that you can view. So you can zoom into your property. The first box says projected flooding. That's what we looked at. And the other one we looked at was the one on the lower right, coast, FEMA coastal erosion. Next. It'll pull you to a map that looks something like this, where you can zoom into your property and then you can toggle on and off the different maps or layers projections on the left. You know, this is not exact, so it's supposed to be used to give you an idea you know, at the landscape scale. So um, I wouldn't like compare your neighbor's house with yours, for example. Next. What do we do? Uh, we tend to bend our solutions into four different groups. Protection, which would be build a wall, protect ourselves. Adaptive designs, Cecil is going to talk more about that. Here's an example of the picture in the background of the Edgartown Yacht Club that was raised two feet in 2019. That's an example of, of an adaptive design that cost $7.5 million, so very expensive to do that. Restoration of natural coastal areas. If you click to the next slide, I have an example of that. We talked about Nantucket Harbor here on the left and the flooding. This picture on the right shows that barrier beach, the Cascade Cotu Wildlife Refuge that is protecting that harbor from sea level rise and specifically storm surge. And it shows some areas where we might experience potential breaches. So we're looking into that. But we have these barrier beaches all around the islands and they're at risk. Next. And then the last option is retreat and relocation, which is a real conversation we need to have. These projects are expensive and there may be some areas that we cannot make resilient. Next. Oh, so that's the end. Our sponsors are Remain Nantucket and Breckenridge, Breckenridge Capital Advisors. I do want to mention that on Martha's Vineyard, many of the towns have gone through a municipal vulnerability preparedness planning process. And then the Martha's Vineyard Commission is pulling all of the towns together and partners together to develop a climate, climate adaptation plan. And then in Nantucket, they have developed a coastal resilience plan that just came out in November. So there's a lot of planning work going around in this arena about what's at risk and what we can do about it. So the next slide just gives you my contact information and then we'll open it up to questions. I think Javon and Christine will facilitate. Yep, so Cynthia, here's a question. Um, what can I do to lessen the impacts of sea level rise on my property? It's hard. It's hard to do something on your individual property. Um, I would zoom in on those maps and check out what the impacts are gonna be. Get active, talk with your local uh, towns and elected officials and find out what are they doing at the larger landscape scale to combat this or make our coastlines and our infrastructure more resilient. It's not the kind of thing where you can go out on your property and build a wall, but ignore everyone around. It needs to be done at a larger landscape level. I would say one thing you can do is leave vegetation alone. Don't trample the dune grass. Dunes and grass are our friends, so that can definitely help. Um, let's see. And 
Yeah, another another thing you can do not specific to your property would be to help support organizations that are doing this work and volunteer. We have lots of volunteer opportunities that you can get engaged with us. Any other questions? Sorry, we have another question here, Cynthia. This relates, I think, to our first State of the Coast report. Um, and it's, do you have any remarks about similar studies on Cape Ann Coast? Um, yeah, so, so we did a report in 2020 for the North Shore, and there are, I, I was not here, so I'm less familiar with some of the um, discussions we've had with the town or how they're moving forward with some of that information, but I can speak to the data, which shows that we see similar impacts there. We see a lot of beach erosion, habitat erosion, and where that's in a natural area, that's one thing where it's in an area where we have these coastal communities right up to the coast. Um, it can also be a challenge. So for example, in the Rockport area, I know they've invested millions on seawalls to protect the communities from storm surge. And there are several areas where them and other communities are looking at the resilience of those seawalls. Do we need to raise them up? Is it worth it? There's potential to put big sand and dune nourishment projects out where you just dump a bunch of sand. Um, those can work, but they're short term and they're also very costly. So I think to the that's the extent I can really answer that question in this arena, but I would encourage them to look at the report for the North Shore. Okay, and then I think we have one more time for one more question and then we'll um, we'll get back to people for any additional questions we haven't been able to get to. Um, but what kinds of impacts are we seeing on our beaches as a result of climate change, um, Cynthia? And I'm, I'm guessing this is just islands in general. Yeah, so I'll give you a teaser for this to encourage you to tune in to the February 2nd webinar on beaches and coastal banks. <laughs> but the impact we see on our beaches where we don't have infrastructure um, is we see a lot of erosion happening, similar to what I showed you. We see a loss of habitat, in some cases, a loss of shorebird habitat. We have a lot of these barrier beaches that we're seeing erode and breach, and sometimes they build back, but they're continuing to migrate. And in a lot of cases, the erosion rate is outpacing the accretion rate where sand is building up. So you may be familiar with some beaches like Norton Point, where we've just done a big dune project to restore the dune there and maintain access. But there are other portions of the beach where we have not been able to allow at least over sand vehicle access for some time. So we're thinking about access, we're thinking about habitat, um, and we're thinking about coastal resilience in general and community resilience. All right, thanks everyone. I think it is my job now to pass the mic over to Cecil Baron Jensen, who again is the Executive Director of Remain Nantucket. And she's gonna talk about some resiliency planning work on Nantucket and I will let her give an introduction to herself. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's, uh, del I'm delighted to be here. My name is Cecil Baron Jensen. I'm the executive director of Remain Nantucket. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of the symposium today and it's so fun to be part of this wonderful panel. Many thanks to the trustees for including me and congrats once again for your impactful State of the Coast report. Remain Nantucket and Remain Ventures were founded in 2008 by Wendy and Eric Schmidt. We conduct two kinds of activities, charitable and venture work. Our charitable work is um, an offshoot of the Schmidt Family Foundation and includes our grant, our grant program in partnership with the Community Foundation for Nantucket, support for the town of Nantucket and partnerships with other uh, nonprofits across the island. We also have entrepreneurial venture projects and real estate investments. If you know Nantucket, you might be familiar with some of our beautiful buildings and our amazing tenants. We own a bakery, a culinary center, bookstore, and we've re recently purchased a building that will be used as a food hub and local sustainable grocery store. We have also invested in the island's regional transit authority and own the transportation center on Washington Street. On our venture side, we also work closely with the Chamber of Commerce to support island businesses, including funding the new Keep the Rock Solid grant program and launching the Nantucket Island Center for Entrepreneurship. 
our work aligns with our overall mission. And this, <clears throat> and this is our mission. Remain Nantucket and Remain Ventures are dedicated to strengthening the enduring economic, social, and envi environmental vitality of downtown Nantucket and to encourage innovation and bring resilience across the island. Over the past couple of years, we have turned our attention more closely to this matter of resilience, not just coastal, by the way. We care about systems that hold us together as a community, systems that include energy, communications, culture, transportation, waste management, regenerative agriculture, and economics. Today, though, I want to introduce you to the Envision Resilience Nantucket Challenge. As the sponsor and organizers of Envision Resilience, Remain deliberately wanted to engage in conversations about the future of Nantucket in the face of climate change and sea level rise. We wanted to respond to the rising fear associated with the reality that much of our beloved downtown, as you just saw, is going to be seriously impacted by sea level rise in our lifetime. Instead of running away in fear, we wanted to present hopeful images to our community. We wanted to illustrate that a future with more water didn't have to be anything less than beautiful. As you'll have seen in the State of Coast report, much of the island is threatened and in jeopardy of being impacted by erosion, sea level rise, and flooding from storm surges. Christine, maybe now you could run through some of the storm images. Yeah, you'll see they're pretty dramatic. That's the one that you're looking at there was our, our, our where our, our steamship ferry comes in. You can see that there on the left. But yeah, sure, Christine, just run through them and it'll give people a, a sense of what we're dealing with. This was from this year, by the way. This was uh, well, actually just at the very end of 2020, 2021. Okay, so just this month, we've seen substantial flooding downtown as a result of winter storms. On dog walks across the island, I've seen marshes and coastal paths leaking water onto roadways and impacting well-worn trails. Issues around erosion have sent us into panic mode in several spots around the island's perimeter. It is almost impossible for those of us who call Nantucket home year round to avoid this issue. It is no wonder that according to a survey we conducted last year, over 88% of the visitor and residential population is either concerned or alarmed about sea level rise. For those of you who haven't already heard about Envision Resilience Nantucket Challenge, it was a year long project that asked graduate and undergraduate students from five of the country's leading design programs to imagine Nantucket's waterfront with as much as nine more feet of water by the year 2100. We worked with students and faculty from Northeastern University, Harvard, Yale, University of Florida, and the University of Miami. They studied three distinct areas of Nantucket Harbor, Grant Point, Downtown, and Washington Street and the Creeks. Their well-researched and thought-provoking designs formed the centerpiece of an expanded community engagement campaign, which included presentations, a speaker series, coffee roundtables, and a public art installation. Okay, Christine, let's show them. Yeah, this is the exhibition here. And Christine, you'll just run through some of these images as I speak. We were especially proud of an exhibition of the Envision Resilience Nantucket Challenge in the Thomas Macy Warehouse on Strait Wharf, which ran from June to December last year. While exhibiting our students' innovative designs and visions for Nantucket, the exhibition was also designed to engage and inspire our community to consider building adaptation, relocation, sustainable landscapes, and other resilient strategies on their own properties. Happily, we had over 2,500 visitors and many more people who joined, joined us for talks, openings, and special occasions in the building. One of our favorite takeaways from hosting the exhibition was how people really engaged with the students' work. They even pointed to their own houses in the study areas. 
They responded to the designs with personal anecdotes and asked questions rooted in their own and the community's concerns and fears. If Nantucket wasn't their home, they connected the dots and pointed to opportunities that would work in their towns and cities. Like my fellow panelists, we believe firmly that knowledge is power. And for that reason, all of the designs, weekly lectures, and resources are searchable on our website, envisionresilience.org. Christine, let's show them the light installation. Oh no, they actually, no, no, run through these, Christine, that's great. These are the students' designs. Yep, you can keep, yeah. So that, those are really great um, adaptive designs that the various students came up with. That one is really interesting. Yeah, all of them. One of the things that we really loved about all of the designs is that not only incorporated um, a fresh new think, thinking of a way to build buildings in Nantucket, but they all, you'll notice, in, incorporate green energy sources, which um, is going to be really important as we go forward. <clears throat> okay, there we go. There's the public art installation. While the challenge was focused on Nantucket, as you can see from our community engagement efforts, it was also designed to inspire others in, commu in coastal communities around the world. You can click through to the next one. Yeah, there you go. This was our, our light installation. It was an incredible art installation that we projected. Um, it was, it's called a light or image projection on that building in downtown Nantucket in October last year. And it told the story of sea level rise in, in, the, in a really compelling way. Um, but anyway, since the, uh, ultimately the whole project was intended to be a demonstration exercise for how we can all live innovatively with rising seas. Yesterday, we sent out a second of our two-part survey we are hoping to gauge whether people's views about sea level rise have changed in the year following the increased activity and educational awareness on the subject of coastal resilience. This includes, of course, Envision Resilience, the State of the Coast Report, the communications and the publication around the uh, island's coastal resilience, res, uh, resilience plan, which Christine mentioned as well. Um, and, oh, oh, sorry, Cynthia mentioned as well. It's, uh, it's really been a big year, and we hope that the combined effort will show in the survey results an uptick in people's willingness to adapt to sea level rise and embrace green energy and it alternatives. And we have some really great news. So do you wanna to go to the next slide? Thanks. I'm happy to announce today that we are taking the Envision Resilience model to another location starting next week. Students from six universities will, studying four will be studying four locations in Narragansett Bay. The universities are the University of Rhode Island, Roger Williams University, RISD, Northeastern, Syracuse, and the University of Florida. This year, we have students with a wide variety of specialties, including architecture, landscape design, journalism, historic preservation, law, marine studies, and more. These multi multidisciplinary teams will be grounded in the latest science and policies, and they will test their ideas against the realities of financial and real estate constraints. Working in Rhode Island has been a wholly different experience for us, both in geography, but also in the region's already high level of engagement on the subject. Rhode, Rhode Island planners, climate scientists, university leaders, and politicians are more than ready to start envisioning. In fact, they are ready to act. They are looking for concrete ideas that they can build on. In truth, they are already responding to the changes that are happening due to rising seas and have welcomed us and our project with open arms. We are extraordinarily proud of all of our faculty partners and their students and deeply impressed by their commitment to solving the challenging problems we have today with creativity and integrity. Their optimistic, practical, and beautiful solutions to the mounting problems of sea level rise are indeed inspiring. And as Wendy Schmidt, Remain Nantucket's founder has said, you have to imagine something before you can begin to work toward it. Thank you.
And before I introduce Linda, I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Cecil. Uh, we have a few here. So let me start with, is the town of Nantucket going to use any of the students' designs? Well, you know, that is such a great question and we get asked it all the time. Um, the answer is not specifically, but they're certainly inspiring some of the solutions. Uh, we've had some really great conversations with the town and with some of the other stakeholders that who own property right on the harbor. And uh, they are, they're working with consultants now who are imagining similar outcomes that the students did. So I think that it's more inspirational for all of us. And, and that's a really important um, point. And I know that, that uh, Cynthia got asked this question about what individual homeowners can do. And to tell you the truth, individual homeowners have to be part of the solution. We can't wait for the town or for major stakeholders who own property on the coast to act because they're not gonna solve our individual problems. So thinking about living shorelines and planting um, with sustainable gardening practices, including using um, resilient and indigenous plants is, is super important for all of us. So uh, I think that, that the students work definitely engaged the whole island into thinking about what they can do on their own properties. And that includes, you know, those, those of us like me, who's not actually on the coast, but, you know, I'm well aware of the choices that I make, whether it's in gardening or um, home construction and green energy practices, I know that that's going to impact it in the long run too. Okay, great. Um, and then we have another question here. Since one of Nantucket's big draws is the old cozy architecture, how can some of the new visuals you showed on Brant Point fit in? Yeah, that, you know, that was kind of an interesting thing. The students, the, the some of the images that you saw were from students who live in Florida. So some, <laughs> some of those designs actually fit probably better in Florida than they do here. But that doesn't mean that um, our architecture can't adapt. And I think the Preservation Trust has been um, an incredible leader out here in helping us understand how we preserve the things that are really important, but also adapt to changes. And so some of the designs that we're seeing, um, even on Brant Point, include raising up properties, uh, planting different plants at you know, a new height, uh, so if your property is raised up so that the plants in front of it, you don't see as much of the, you know, the fact that the building is raised up. Um, but also, I think that the, that we do have to be a little bit forward thinking and Nantucket has a long history of being adaptable. Um, if we go back in time, you see a lot of our buildings were actually, our 17th century buildings were picked up and moved into places for 18th century properties and 18th century buildings were picked up and moved for 19th century. So we've had this really great tradition of reusing our buildings. And I, I'm not necessarily saying that we're going to need to relocate neighborhoods, but we do need to think about how we're going to adapt. So some of the historic integrity of the properties and the buildings can stay intact, but they can still be responsive to the challenges that are coming because of sea level rise. Okay, great. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, what do you think was the response to Envision Resilience, the State of the Coast Report, and other coastal resilience initiatives last year? What do I think of it all? I am so excited. I know that when we started this project, Envision Resilience, um, back in 2018, we were sort of scraping around the edge and saying, what exactly does this all mean? And now there's this great new fluency to the subject on Nantucket. People are talking about it. It's in all the newspapers and magazines and online uh, media resources. Um, individual homeowners are, are starting to really ask what they can do. The town is showing incredible leadership. Our nonprofit organizations have really stepped up, including the trustees, and we're so grateful for, for all of the work that you're doing on Nantucket. So 
I know this is a really dark subject, and I know that there's lots of reasons to be nervous, but honestly, I think that, as I said before, Nantucket is super adaptable, and we, we have a good track record of learning from the past, and I think that we're, it's all coalescing into something that is going to be kind of exciting, and as I said, I think living with more water really can be a beautiful thing, and we just have to be ready for it. Okay, are we ready? Should I pass it along to Linda? All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Cecil. Um, and thank you everybody who set up this interesting program. I always learn a lot, even from my own colleagues. Um, I am Linda Orell, the Director of Policy with the Trustees of Reservations. My work is to advocate mostly at the State House, but we are expanding some of our work at the federal level, and occasionally I work on local policy as well. Um, by way of background, I've been a State House lobbyist on and off for 25 years and worked for um, a couple of other nonprofits doing similar work. And what I'd like to talk about today is a specific bill that the trustees helped draft and file at the State House. And it's called the Flood Risk Protection Legislation. And Christine, you can show us the first slide. Um, we uh, call it FRIP, Flood Risk, the Flood Risk Protection Program. This is a bill that was just filed for this legislative session for the first time. Um, next slide, please. And the purpose of the bill is to help individual homeowners, nonprofits, businesses, and in some cases, entire neighborhoods retreat from flood prone areas. Uh, this is a statewide bill, so we would, this would create a new statewide program to work with communities, nonprofits, homeowners, and businesses to identify properties that are at high risk of flooding, whether they're projected to be repetitively or substantially damaged by floods, um, and to work with those people to help them understand the benefits of deciding to do something very difficult, which is getting up and leaving their home, relocating to a new home, in some cases in the same neighborhood, community, maybe some people choose to live elsewhere, and then actually demolish the structure, permanently conserve the land and restore it so that the land can, uh, can uh, absorb uh, floodwaters as flooding may get worse from different climate change impacts, whether it's sea level rise, storm surge, or monthly tidal flooding. Um, next slide. We know that we have a major problem globally with flooding and that the problem is going to get significantly worse. The trustees' properties have already been impacted by sea level rise, tidal flooding, and we know those problems are going to continue to get worse. And they're also going to cost the communities, the state, the federal government, individual homeowners, businesses, and entire neighborhoods significant amounts of money in order to address that flooding. We are not prepared. So we would really like to get this piece of legislation on the books as law, which would require three different secretariats to work together and develop a statewide program that not only addresses um, the supporting people who need help because they've already suffered flood damage in their home or building, but also to go help communities and individual homeowners and businesses who are at risk of flooding. So we can be proactive, identify the most at-risk properties, and work with those property owners to help them understand the benefits of moving. So we want to pass this bill now in part because we have an existing threat that's going to get significantly worse. And also we're not ready. Massachusetts can tap into the federal uh, FEMA programs, which do respond after major disasters, but those programs are limited in scope and funding. Uh, they are gonna be needed, funding is gonna be needed more and more nationally, and there may not be enough funding for Massachusetts. And while the FEMA does have one proactive program that goes in and tries to help people who are at risk of flooding and they try to be proactive, it's a new program, it's underfunded, and we're not confident that Massachusetts would ever get enough of those federal funds 
here to do what we need to do now. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the bill itself is a few pages long and I'm not gonna go through all the details, but I'll just give you a few high level points. First, um, we wanted to get state agencies involved with cities and towns and nonprofit partners, whether it's land trust, community development corporations, larger conservation groups like the trustees or our partners, the Nature Conservancy, Mass Audubon, and get all these partners to work together to do outreach to landowners, educate them about the benefits of moving, and identify people who are interested in moving. So this would be a voluntary program. There's no eminent domain involved. And then once we can find uh, those homeowners, hopefully clustered together in what we are defining as continuous or contiguous properties, we would help relocate those people or businesses and demolish the structures and then permanently conserve and restore the land to prepare for climate change impacts. Uh, next slide, please. There are some homeowners who have some resources now. They may have flood insurance or they may have flood insurance provided through the federal government through FEMA, national flood insurance. Um, and in some communities, there have even been grants made available to help people put their house up on stilts or move back. Um, and Cecil just shared some very interesting and beautiful designs on how that can and should happen. There are some places in Massachusetts where there are large populations of homeowners who don't have access to those resources. So the community doesn't have any resources. There are not grants made available to them. They don't have homeowners insurance because it's been canceled because of the high risk of flooding or the homeowner, the uh, flip, sorry, the flood insurance has become so expensive so exorbitantly expensive that they can't afford it or they're not eligible for national flood insurance. Some of those people live in environmental justice populations and there's a, a long and detailed explanation of what an EJ population is in Massachusetts under a new definition in the new climate law that was passed last year. And so we're suggesting in this bill that any state public funds are prioritized for those populations we don't know if the bill passes at some point if the 75% number will stick, but we put it in there as a message that we believe the majority of state funding should go to help populations that don't have other resources to help them address climate and flood risk. Um, next slide, please. There is a trust fund we would create. Um, right now, we don't have a dedicated source of funding for property buyouts to help people. Um, relocate, sell their home at fair market value, um, and move on with their lives, frankly. So in the bill, we create a new trust fund, but we're still working on identifying a dedic dedicated source of funding for that. In the meantime, there actually is some language that passed in the past two environmental bond bills. One passed at the state in 2014, another one in 2018, and in total, they provide $50 million in authorization for coastal property buyout projects. They, that funding could not be used inland. Um, this was specifically called a coastal buyback program and the money is there and the state can use that money on projects. Um, more than half of all cities and towns in Massachusetts have adopted the Community Preservation Act. CPA funds, interestingly, can be used to acquire property, demolish, uh, the buildings and then restore the land. So there are many communities who have local funds available to them if they choose to spend it on projects uh, like this. And of course, we still need to work on identifying a dedicated funding source and that will take us some time. Um, next slide, please. Even though the trustees initiated this legislation, um, we always work collaboratively with our partners. And so we have a very strong coalition. You can see the nonprofits here who we're working with uh, statewide organizations that are very interested in passing this bill. We have two identical bills, one in the House, one in the Senate. The bill already had a hearing. Uh, we testified at the hearing and got excellent questions and a lot of interest from members of the Environment Committee. I know from a conversation yesterday that the chair of the Environment Committee is very, very interested in this bill and probably will put an extension on the bill, meaning that she would like to keep it in the committee 
and do some serious work on it and figure out how to pass it sooner, not later. That doesn't mean this bill will necessarily pass this legislative session. I wouldn't bet on it just because bills don't usually pass that quickly, but it does have a lot of momentum, support, and attention, which is really great. Uh, next slide, please. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, I would be happy to talk offline with anybody who's really interested in this specific piece of legislation and we could go through the bill and all the different things in it. Um, but all I can tell you is right now it's sitting in committee. We don't know what's gonna happen, um, but we feel pretty good about where it stands at this time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Linda. Um, someone wants to know how this differs from existing federal programs. A great question. So the Federal Emergency Management Agency has a few property buyout programs that operate differently depending on the circumstance. Most of them um, are post-disaster. So they come in and help homeowners rebuild or in unusual circumstances, they might actually remove a building and then um, help people relocate. They do have a new program, relatively new, that passed in 2018 under FEMA called BRIC. It's the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program. It is designed to proactively help communities become more resilient to climate impacts. They haven't done any property buyout projects in Massachusetts. We are concerned that even though it's a pretty good looking program, that it's insufficiently funded and spread over 50 states that Massachusetts will not see significant funding from that federal program. It's also used on a variety of other types of projects, not only property buyouts. So perhaps at some point, some brick funds could be used in Massachusetts for property buyouts, but not at the level that we need it to happen now. So we, we don't think the federal government is going to be able to um, provide the amount of resources that we need. The second issue is it, it is highly bureaucratic at FEMA. Um, no slight against our federal friends who work really hard on this, but it, it takes up to 10 years to do a property buyout project through FEMA. So we thought we would create this bill that um, where we could do property buyout projects a little bit more quickly. We would have state funding right there available to people who live in Massachusetts and communities to work on these projects instead of waiting for a federal grant. Um, and also we put in the bill a couple of important things. First, we are focused on environmental justice communities and FEMA is not. It's not that they don't focus on communities that need, they have one provision for small rural communities, small impoverished rural communities, um, but there aren't as many of those communities in Massachusetts, whereas there's a lot of environmental justice populations. We are offering relocation assistance to lessees and tenants, and the federal government does not do that. We are focused specifically on continuous and contiguous properties so we can try to restore entire neighborhoods, thereby protecting whole communities from climate change impacts using nature-based solutions. We are also offering grants directly to not only state agencies and cities and towns, but also nonprofits who are really important partners in doing some of these projects, especially the pieces associated with land acquisition and wetland restoration. So there are specific differences in the state and federal bills, or state and federal, our bill and their law, where we are trying to fill in really important gaps. So that was a great question. Thank you. Okay, I think we have one more time. Oh, what question for time for one more question, excuse me, before we throw it back to Cynthia for the closing. Um, and Jennifer would like to know, is there a call to action around this bill, Linda? Right to our legislators. Is there a bill number that you could share? Yeah, so if you go back one slide, there's two bill numbers. And we don't have a current call to action. And the reason for that is the two bills are in the Environment Committee, and we know the Environment Committee chairs believe that this bill is a priority and that they're going to strongly support passage of the bill. That doesn't mean it'll pass into law this year, uh, but we know that they are very supportive. So ordinarily we'd have a call to action to try to persuade the committee chairs to report a bill out favorably. And then when the bill gets to other committees like Ways and Means, we would also have a call to action to persuade leadership in the House and Senate to move on those bills. Right now, we're tweaking the bill in committee, and we have the support we need. Having said that, please keep your eye out on the trustees' website. There's a blog there 
We have done a couple of calls to action um, this year, and we might end up doing another one on this bill. And that's likely where we would post um, an action alert. And sometimes our partners at Mass Audubon um, also do action alerts surrounding bills, and this is one of their priorities. So you can get on their action alert list as well. So thank you all for the opportunity to share um, this, what I think is exciting and complicated uh, legislation, but really important um, policy for Massachusetts. And Linda, it didn't look like Christine was able to back, go back a slide. Do you have those bill numbers? You can yeah, see. I'm gonna uh, go look them up really quickly while you. Okay. All right, so that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you'll be joining us next week for the second in the series. It's called An Exciting Year of Contemporary Art at the Trustees, uh, presented by Jessica May. And then, as I mentioned, there are three of these webinars in the full series that focus on State of the Coast. So the next one's February 2nd on beaches and coastal banks. And the third one is February 23rd on salt marsh and habitats. If you want to see all those, register for links, uh, and also get the recordings from the webinars, you can go to our website, thetrustees.org the forward slash webinars. And again, everything you heard today would not be possible without our donors, including supporters like our Founder Circle members or top supporters like our Founder Circle members. So thank you again for joining us today, for investing in our mission and for believing in a brighter future. See you next week. <laughs>